Exhausting hamster wheel and into balance living with Dr. Marissa. I promise you joy in the mystery. Dr. Marissa, also known as the Asian Oprah. Her mission to be a beneficial presence on the planet. Her purpose to be your personal advocate to live, laugh, love, learn. Her life motto, don't die wondering. Take back your life with Dr. Marissa. Welcome. You are tuned into my weekly talk radio TV show called Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa every Thursday, primetime, 4 p.m. on my CNBC, NBC News Radio channel, KCAA, AM 1050, FM 102.3, FM 106.5, and streaming everywhere there are podcasts. So Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, it's too Ooh. much to go on. But this is a show about hope and happiness. So there's no gossip, no scandal. And I used to say no K words, although I understand that Kim Kardashian actually is doing some great things. So I can't say that anymore. But I want you to focus on things you can control, which is your happiness, because that's your birthright. 88% happiness on a happy 88 mission, 88 million more happy people in the next eight years. So thank you for joining me. If you've missed any of my past shows, with everyone from Marianne Williamson to Marianne from Gilligan's Island to half of the cast from Happy Days. I'm going to be having a Where Are You Car 52 Hank Garrett on next week. So you know that the, the people that I bring on are not just people that are iconic TV or movie stars. They're people who are helping with solution to more peace, love, and joy on the planet. So Fran Drescher came on not to talk about the nanny, but her cancer schmancer effort on how you can reduce risk of cancer. So go to my YouTube channel, get the free subscribe, go and find, look, get my uh, red carpet interview with Halle Berry and John Travolta, because I want you to be happy 88% of the time. Not 100%. Why? Because if you're 100% happy, you're dead. I want you to be 88%. If, you, if you're if you looking at me now, I know you thought I was Swedish, but I'm actually Chinese. Eight's a lucky number in Chinese. So 88% is your birthright to be happy. And I'm so delighted. I know you're not even looking at me because you're looking at the other beautiful woman on the camera right now. I am just so delighted. This is just to get to know her. I didn't want to pre-interview. I just want to get to know her on the air. You know me. I love to uh, go where no host has gone before. <laughs> but I do have a very special guest today. Her name is Dion Lim. She's an Emmy award-winning TV news anchor and reporter at ABC KGO TV in San Francisco and the author of Make Your Moment, The Savvy Woman's Communication Playbook to Getting to the Success You Want. And it is, yes, part of the Asian Oprah giveaway. If you stay till the end, you'll get your own coffee. Copy. Uh, she's based on her experiences as the first Asian American woman to be at the helm of a weekday newscast in three major markets including Kansas City, Charlotte, and Tampa Bay. She's passionate about amplifying voices of color and has led the charge in shedding light on the hate and assaults targeting Asian Americans in the Bay Area and everywhere else, I might say. It's not just in the Bay Area. She's known for her re uh, uh, work in reporting. It's resonated across the country on ABC News Live, Nightline, and 2020. Whether it be speaking circuit for Fortune 500 companies or in recently published op-eds in the San Francisco Chronicle and in an in-depth interview for New York Magazine about covering hate crimes in the time of COVID-19, Dion's message is loud and clear. Representation matters now more than ever, and we can do it through communication. Please welcome to my studio, Dion. Thank wow. you so much. <laughs> I'm so honored to be here. That was quite an introduction. You are on fire. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. And we're and getting a little bit of an echo here. I don't know why. So I'll try to fix that. But I thought if with your, um, with your permission, I'd like to show one of the clips that you did that I thought was particularly interesting. 
And uh, for those of you who haven't seen her on camera, which would be surprising, it'll give a baseline for us to jump off, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would give it an idea of what I do. This is just a small fraction of what's coming to light. A woman seen dragged through the streets in Oakland in a strong-armed robbery, clinging to her purse. Less than five minutes away, another woman is attacked for her bag and her car stolen. In San Francisco, a man is knocked to the ground in Japantown for his cell phone. E Google translated what happened. These are just some of the dozens of incident reports from Asian Americans I've received from you in recent days. After so many high-profile attacks, many are speaking out for the first time, like Niha Tran, COO of the popular Burma Superstar Restaurant Group. We felt the need and, like you said, the obligation and the responsibility to use the voice that's been given to us by the previous generation to speak out and say what's happening. This after multiple incidents at their Oakland location, including this man who threw a bottle of sanitizer at an employee and another bashing in the front window. While these victims are all Asian, it's important to note not all of these crimes are racially motivated. Many in law enforcement tell me Asians just happen to be easy targets for these crimes of opportunity because we're smaller in stature. Asian seniors congregate in places like Chinatowns, but it's also cultural. I mean, my parents were just robbed in broad daylight here as well. My dad with a stroke sitting in his car and he just feels helpless and he's screaming and people but just... now that culture is shifting we've seen throngs of asian americans speaking out celebrities like daniel wu and daniel day kim offered a twenty-five thousand dollar reward to assist in the arrest of a suspect in this series of attacks on seniors community members are also raising tens of thousands of dollars for patrols we saw a man pass out hundreds of air horns in oakland's chinatown Manju Kulkarni of the Asian Pacific Policy Planning Council is co-founder of the Stop API Hate Reporting Center, which tracked nearly 3,000 hate-fueled incidents across the country in an eight-month period. 2,800 is really just the tip of the iceberg. She believes of those reported, 90% of those incidents don't rise to the level of criminal activity, but still need to be reported. We may not take action on every single one of those uh, as a society, but we need to know and understand what's happening. So these incidents don't keep happening. Mm, they are so hard to watch. Now, Niha Tran of Burma Superstar also told me he is dedicating $5,000 as a reward to help those who are victimized by crimes like this. Dan and Amma. Oh, it is just so uh, sickening and tiring, Dion, to see these week in and week out like this. And so eye-opening to hear uh, you receive dozens of tips in a matter of days. I know that's uh, mm. emotional for you even as a veteran reporter, but mm. how many do you think actually go unreported? Yeah, you know, that's a great question because there are no statistics on that. But in my experience alone, the overwhelming majority of the cases I've looked into go unreported. I hear from many children, many grandchildren of victims who say they try and encourage their elders to report, but it is not easy. So in turn, many of them are taking to social media, trying to get the word out however they can. Now, the good news, obviously, Dion, is we are seeing what's really happening out there, and that's a positive. We can address it. Indeed. Yeah, thanks so much, Dion. Wow. Wow. I mean, I looked at all the clips um, yesterday. Uh, peace in, peace out. Shout out to, to Jin, by the way, mm -hmm. who is how I, I, I uh, found you and uh, her, her fireside chat with yours, with you. Now, I always ask my guests, did you think when you were young that this is what you were going to be doing? <laughs> <laughs> I have to laugh because I think the only way to eloquently say that is hell no. <laughs> well, well, first off, first off, being Asian, right? When you grow up, your parents always tell you as a child, okay, you've got to be a doctor, you've got to be a lawyer, you've got to be a mathematician. My dad was a chemist. So, you know, he'd bring home super glue and dry ice and all those things. And I think he secretly wanted me to be that. But when I was growing up, I wanted to be a whole host of things, right? Um, maybe an actress or maybe some kind of, I don't know, online uh, presence, even though back then, you know, online wasn't really even a big deal. Um, so when I started reporting, I was always typecast and always kind of enjoyed doing the happy stories, right? There's even a poster that is in our building that says Dion Lim finds the good because I do stories about 
everyday people, seemingly unremarkable people doing extraordinary things. And for most of my career, I thought that was what I would be doing. Um, never did I think this was going to be my so-called beat, that every day I would wake up and be faced with so many different stories. Um, and it really kind of culminated over the years, but really accelerated um, you know, with the last administration and the influx of the terms China virus and Kung flu and people coming forward and feeling like they trusted me to share their stories. And that's kind of how it snowballed. Yeah. And you, you're you like the go-to person now. People who don't feel comfortable going to the police will go to you. Uh, is that part of your, why do you think that is? I feel so incredibly honored that people feel like they can come to me because when you think about it, going to police is a really invasive kind of scary process, right? Because first off, there's this distrust, especially with older Asian Americans. I remember my own family not really thinking that the police could be trusted. But when they're coming around, they're poking, they're prodding, looking for evidence, and they're asking you for your phone number and for all of your friends' contacts, it's overwhelming and it's too much because when you're at the lowest low of your life, right, and you are faced with such a tremendous burden of dealing with uh, awful crime, the last thing you want to do is talk to someone you don't know. And I think because of social media, because of people seeing me on TV, because of me sharing my own story of hate and discrimination, others feel like, okay, maybe she's okay and I trust her. And, right. you know, it's a really amazing thing that people can open up. So for that, I'm, I'm really grateful. Do, do you ever hesitate to open the video or open another news thing? It's like, mm -hmm. are, are you, I, I, um, Jin sent over your final, your final word on something. And, I, and my first thought was, oh my God, she's hit the limit and she's not doing this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't take this anywhere, which would be understandable, which would yeah. be understandable. So, so I'm to, before you answer that, I'm going to yeah. show this particular clip that just, hit my heart and I want you to tell the story behind this but okay. this is just so that the audience gets an idea of what your face was as part of your job I want to go with him I have a heart problem, and after that, I, it getting worse. I have to go to hospital. They were aware this. They have to chase what's going on with my heart. Am I? He stayed with me for 20 years, but in my whole life, I had to spend a whole life to remember him. I don't think it should be a human could go through it. Oh, I remember that like yesterday. It was the most heartbreaking interview I've ever done. And I only had to ask two questions because this woman who had lost her son to gun violence very senselessly was telling her story for the very first time. I had tried for a long time to find her, to talk with her, but the family wasn't ready. And when she was ready and agreed to talk, it just opened the floodgates. And that was the day, I'm glad you played that clip. That was the day I was in my office and also in the newsroom and I melted down. I had a breakdown because I had I realized I had been holding, harboring all of this pain and just empathy for all of these victims. And it just came spilling out. And I started hyperventilating. And I said to my, my manager, I said, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. And fortunately, 
you know, he talked me off a ledge and, and said, you can do this. You know, this is your purpose mm -hmm. and just take your time. Don't worry about deadline. Just try your best. And we got her story out on the air. Yeah. Just, just beautiful. I, I'm one that, is, you know, I try to cry once a week because I know it's good for tears or the disinfectant that keep my heart soft. I tell my clients to do that. Wink, wink, nod, nod, Jen. Uh, I, I know that it's part of the healing process, but I, I also recognize um, the toll that it takes. So for that reason, I would like to uh, award you with the uh, Dr. Marissa Beneficial Presence on the Planet Award. Which I don't give to all my guests because what you're doing is so important as you as an Asian American yourself in the media, you're not shying away from it. You're actually shedding some healing light to the stories. And, and that's what I got from doing the research. So thank oh you. Oh my gosh, thank you. I didn't expect this whatsoever, but it means a lot because I say this often and I mean it every single time that on those days that I really wanna quit and stop doing this and I ask myself, why am I doing this? I could easily have a perfectly good career, which I had for the past 15 years without having to bear this burden, but knowing that people are paying attention, knowing that you have taken something away and felt a little bit empowered from the coverage that people are speaking out, to me that makes me wanna keep going. Yeah, it is. It is really. So. And and I know we share another thing in common, which is we're both Chinese. Mm -hmm. We have Chinese immigrant parents is my understanding. Yes. Uh, and so there's for those who think that that we are naturally um, easy, <laughs> uh, shy wallflower, mm -hmm. sarcasm intended. Sarcasm is another service I offer uh, that there's some cost. I don't know about your parents, but to this day, you know, when I'm on the air or on camera and this is not something as a as a Chinese woman, we are taught that is OK. Did you go through that at all? Oh, a million percent. And it was not as a parent until I started covering this subject because I have an email from my mom. I mean, God bless her. She's wonderful. But it's that old school way of thinking, right, of that you need to keep your head down, keep your nose clean, don't cause any trouble. So I'm reporting day in and day out on all of this violence, all of the attacks on the AAPI community. And my mother sent me an email, I'll never forget it, that basically said that I need to stop, that I was bringing dishonor, right, and shame to our people, casting us in a negative light. And I felt very guilty, but I just kept going. I didn't even have the mental fortitude to type an email back to her, a snarky teenage Dion email, right. because I just said, what's the point? I'm never going to change her opinion. Um, but when I eventually started gaining more traction and people started paying attention, when I, when I showed up on 2020 one day, <laughs> I think okay. like, <laughs> <laughs> Finally, because my mom could quantify my success, right? And that's culturally what they want, is they want their children to be successful. And for her, seeing me on a national stage, that was her realizing the light bulb went off. Oh, this is a good thing. Yes. I think the same thing with mine. When, when my book went number one, she yeah. finally could say, you know, I'm proud of you. But really, we are, and, and that's a, a topic I, I wanted to just touch on, because we're of a de generation that doesn't necessarily follow what that generation followed. The saying, the Japanese and Chinese saying, the nail that stands up is hammered down. And that to toot your own horn is embarrassing. And you don't, family, you know, don't air the dirty laundry, don't talk about anything personal in public. You can't say, you know, all those icebreaker exercises that we do in the company, those are not okay because you're sharing some personal stuff. Mm -hmm. And how dare you? I mean, to this day, my, you know, when I was modeling, my parents thought I was stripping. I mean, that was the level of, you know, embarrassment and shame yeah. for what I was doing. So how do we bridge this gap? for us in the media and for for you know those who are doing this work because it's it gets frustrating right because mm -hmm. like your uh, the the other anchor that was speaking in that clip they you you're not necessarily 
getting the people to speak who are the victims, mm -hmm. right? Their children and their grandchildren are saying, you know, like, 你要, 你要, 你要跟人讲吗? You, you <laughs> have to speak, right? But but they're, because of their cultural upbringing, it's so difficult. So how do we do that? Because it ties into all of that, you know, we're the model minority because we don't speak up and we know our place, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, four <laughs> questions in there. There were four <laughs> questions. I will answer all of them and solve all the world's problems right yes. now. Uh, you know, it, it, it is a multifaceted answer, right? And I have to say, during this time when America is looking inward at ourselves and our shortcomings and our prejudices toward other parties, we hear this word, and it's so often in tech in the Bay Area, especially allyship. And I don't know if people truly know what that term means, because allyship is not some grand gesture necessarily. You do not have to start a rally or do a march down to City Hall and make your voice heard that way, because that's scary to a lot of people, especially Asian Americans who have been brought up in that culture of right? Not being that nail that sticks up. So allyship to me has been shown, and I'm going to give you some examples, some really wonderful ways. There was a terrible incident not too long ago in Oakland, California, where an Asian couple and their seven-year-old daughter were broken into their home. The mother and father were tied up and a blanket was put over them. The seven-year-old had to listen to that experience as her home was getting ransacked. And this story would have gone in the darkness. No one would have known about it had there not been a very brave woman. Her name is Karen. She's a, you know, a community volunteer. She works a lot with children in Oakland. Her passion is to help others, but that's not her necessary nine to five day job. But she sent me a message because she had seen my work and she said, Dion, this is a really terrible story. It happened in our community. Will you come if I help tell them their story? You know, if I help share their story. Mm -hmm. And she helped me. She didn't need translation at this point, but she did kind of soften the blow and made this family feel comforted and, and secure in that it was okay to share. And believe it or not, not only the mom, but also the seven-year-old girl went on camera, this is unprecedented, and mm -hmm. shared with me every step of the way what happened and what ultimately ended up resulting was that the community came out and flooded their GoFundMe that the friend had set up. And now they're able to have a little bit of peace. A security camera company came out and installed state-of-the-art technology in their home. Their neighbors are now on the lookout and it's a very powerful thing. So I think that's one way that we need to help each other is, is find those ways to get others to be on board and understand that it's for the greater good. I'm not gonna ramble on too much longer, but- okay, No, 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 <laughs> please. <laughs> just, just, just yesterday, I had a 71 year old man who was robbed of his jade necklace, grabbed by the neck, bitten by a woman in a car, dragged down the street with his face down, lost seven teeth. It took him five days to finally understand the importance of speaking out because he was mad. He wanted change. He said enough is enough. Imagine being 71, never speaking out before, but it was his sister and it was some community leaders that said, this is going to be a good thing. He didn't want to show his face at first, but I said, look, mm -hmm. if you show your face, you make this real. You will resonate with everyone else who says, I have a relative or a loved one that looks like you mm -hmm. to act and do something. And this morning in my phone, I had at least, I don't know, a dozen offers from different dentists across the wow. Bay Area offering to replace his broken teeth. It was really a, a touching moment. That is, that's an awesome, awesome. Is this by any chance the guy? Ooh, no, but this is another one. This is a man whose story would go unreported. I tried so hard to find him. He was beaten at a bus stop randomly mm -hmm. in San Francisco. And I'm blurring his eyes because I couldn't find him, but someone who cared about him shared this with me and said, if you can help find him, I would really like to be able to tell his story and help him in some way, but we can't help if right. we don't know who it is. 
right, right. And yeah. that's and that's the that's the hard part. And if you've just tuned in and you're wondering who this beautiful woman on my stage is today, I am Dr. Marissa. You're tuned in to take my advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. And today's beautiful guest is Dion Lim. She is the award, Emmy Award winning news anchor up in San Francisco with ABC and KGO TV. And she's here to enlighten, as, as you know, every other week, I have been trying to continue to keep the limelight on uh, moving from stop, uh, moving from Asian hate to get, let's get into the solution. What can we do to now begin to heal, not just the hate in our community, uh, uh, especially in our community, but also trying to chip away at the racism that seems to have taken over our country, at least in the public's eye. So I'm so delighted to have her here. We've been talking about the different um, stories that she's had to go through. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to highlight when, when you were saying, you know, all these every day you're getting stories every day and i know when watching those clips the most natural reaction is oh my god like how can this be happening and how dare they and then we go into this very strong let's find where to put the blame mm -hmm. and i think that that's a natural thing for us human beings but i think there's multi levels of solution that blame not necessarily will bring us into moving into solution. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I saw your clips. You you actually are part of Be the Change. You don't just report it, but you're going after the uh, assi uh, assistant DA or the actual DA, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is which is brave because you're actually doing something. What can people do on a you know besides shake their heads and and say? this is horrible, how can this happen and who's to blame? Yeah, I love that you're asking this because there's one thing about showing a scandalous video and having no context, right? And then going a step further and providing a solution, one that's long lasting, one that's tangible, one that's more than just, oh, it'll be okay and go to this website. Because frankly, if we keep telling people, go to this website and donate, they cannot connect with how that is actually directly helping. And I get that criticism a lot from the audience. So I would say there are a number of ways and finding that one solution that fits with you isn't going to necessarily be the same as somebody else's. I would recommend having those really challenging conversations, right? Whenever you have an opportunity to educate, please do it if you are Asian American or not. And that's why I was so proud to be a part of producing a piece about the model minority myth for Good Morning America, because that shows the deep rooted history of Asian Americans. And when you look at our history of oppression in the US, it actually is not all that different from the oppression that other immigrants from different ethnic groups went through. So when there is, for example, tension and racism within different ethnic groups, when you can interject something and just say, hey, we need to work together, or we built the railroad, but this group also had to go through years of slavery. That can be a turning point and maybe sometimes enough because facts don't lie. That's the thing is that people for the longest time thought that Asian hate, hate on Asian Americans was not real. But once they started seeing it and getting the statistics behind it, they realized that, oh, having the solution is very key and this is real because we need to work on it. Mm -hmm. I would say another way is what are you good at? Think about what you have to offer the world and how can you manifest that into the good? And I always love this story. It is the oldest fortune cookie factory in Oakland, California. They decided they had to do something. The factory had been taken over by the younger generation of their family. It had gotten passed down and they made BLM fortune cookies. I'm going to send you a box because these are oh. so creative. It, <laughs> they are 
made with activated charcoal and dark chocolate and on the inside have a small saying along with resources of where you can help to have a conversation about Black Lives Matter, but quotes from prominent Black Americans. So when you think about it, it is something that is so uniquely Asian American, Americanized Asian American, right? Yep, so yep, yep. easy for anybody to enjoy. And then you are making change by putting a little slip of paper inside. I mean, come on, it doesn't get any better than that. Yes, yes. It was it. My daughter sent me a picture of a guy she just started dating. She's going to kill me for saying this on the air. But, um, and he's African American and she's uh, Hapa, you know, half Chinese and half uh, Caucasian. And the waiter in the Chinese restaurant brought two fortune cookies and one was dark chocolate and one was the vanilla. Oh my God, I love that. I love that. Of that. And, uh, and I said, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a valuing diversity Chinese restaurant, we think, what we hope, but uh, that, is, that is wonderful. And you're right. I mean, we don't all have to be activists, but even talking about, I know uh, I, I got to facilitate the Santa Monica Community Listening uh, Hate Asian um, Forum. And just having that forum for several of the individuals to have the the first time they've ever talked about yes. what it was like uh, being uh, told to go home, go back to your own country, um, to being called. I was called a gook a year before COVID happened. I mean, this is like, what? You know, 2000. I remember when I first moved to Seal Beach and I, uh, uh, you know, going in the a grocery store in a pavilions and having a woman uh, actively discriminate against me and then having another community woman say, I apologize, we're not like this. <laughs> you yes. know, we're not like this. And so, so I think for wherever you are to take that next step in comfort. So where you used to laugh at jokes, calling a Chinese person, uh, someone with jaundice, or I actually had a, uh, um, a guy say, in all honesty to me, I understand why uh, uh, Asians are bad drivers is because their eyes are so slanted, they have no peripheral vision. And he oh actually God. told me this in all sincerity. And I was so shocked. I didn't say anything. So the, 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 it, it also behooves us as Asian Americans to not necessarily... Um, be bound by our traditional cultural message to not say anything. And I think that is just as important as educating the, the, uh, the non-Chinese supporters. So I, I guess I'm appealing to our Asian brothers and sisters and especially the generation above. Maybe that will never, it's so deeply ingrained that I don't think I'll ever get my mom to, you know, my Chinese mom to, to agree that we should be talking about this, or, you know, <laughs> uh, it, where your mom was before Nightline. So, but, yeah. but I think it's a good thing that we're talking about it. So, yeah, yeah. What do you think about the, the fact that all of us Asians got put in this category along with um, uh, Pacific Islanders when our, our Asians are so different? Oh, oh my god, god. right? right? Uh, you know, you hear the word monolith so often because we are not this all encompassing um, species almost. That's how I feel like people see us. I think if we can just understand how different we are, but how we are all united in the same plight, then we would have a much easier time making our voice heard because don't get me wrong, and I'm gonna go there with this next comment, but there is a lot of tension within different ethnic groups mm -hmm. of Asians Right, and you've probably seen it too. Absolutely. Just this, right, just this past week, I had a victim who said, who happens to be Chinese, start blaming Southeast Asians for these crimes. And I had to, I had to stop and say, wait a second, your attacker was white. We're not even bringing in any other Asian American groups to this. And I'm not gonna continue to put that on the air. I'm not gonna put that in my story. So mm -hmm. I think, I think, again, it, it's that education component as well. Um, and then also 
changing the media's view. And I think that's something that I'm very passionate about talking about right now, because I've been interviewing, um, I was just part of a White House initiative, talking to some Hollywood directors and writers and producers about the need to have better representation, because we also hear that all the time, right? Asians represent, but we need to make sure that that happens on all scales, right? The doctor that gets played in a TV show does not always have to be Korean. Why don't you have it be an Indian doctor? Or why don't you have a Latino doctor? Or why can't Asian Americans be cast as drug dealers or other characters that are not traditional? Um, so I would say that those steps are really important right about now um, to, to kind of make a very clear difference, a, a delineation, and then at the same time, um, understand that everyone is Asian and in this together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I know from personal experience growing up in a Chinese household that the Chinese have a pecking order for the different <laughs> I'm putting that moose on the table. That's my Canadian version of the elephant in the room. So, you know, growing up, uh, being told, you know, stay out of the sun because the darker you are, the lower class Asian you are. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like a real. So we have some some education within our ranks that needs to be done as well. Otherwise, it's still hate on hate and hate on hate is not going to you know, change things. It's still hate. I love that you brought that up because I remember my mom saying that too, right? Giving me an umbrella to go out in the sun. And then when I would lay out and enjoy some of oh. the warm temperatures, you know, yeah. well, that's going to be so bad for your skin and you're going to get too dark. It's going to look so bad. Um, <laughs> but, but you're right in that we need to look inwards during this process too, because we can't continually say, oh, we're being victimized by X, Y, and Z. That perpetuates very bad stereotypes on our end as well, because we don't want to be seen as close-minded and one-track minded on who we think the perpetrators are when it's happening in our own communities. I remember there was a woman who was held up in her driveway and her purse was stolen along with some of her jewelry. And the perpetrator in this case was Filipino and everyone was shocked. Nobody could handle it. And I actually didn't include that in my story, but in the comments of social media, people were saying, oh, here we go again. It's another crime I committed. You know who? And I said, no, actually, and I refuted those comments by explaining, no, it was another Asian American. This mm -hmm. is real, this exists as well. We just mm -hmm. don't see it that often. Right, right, mm -hmm. right, yeah, absolutely. And I'm just looking at the clock, mm -hmm. uh, we're speeding along. I forgot to <laughs> break at halfway, but we'll be right back in two and two as we thank the sponsor who makes this show possible. Peace in, peace out, world peace through inner peace. Want delicious Vietnamese Asian fusion cuisine that is so good for your health you won't believe your taste buds? Olac is a 100% plant-based vegan restaurant founded by Mai on living foods and a love for animals that won't make you sacrifice taste for health. Two locations to delight you, downtown LA and Fountain Valley. So go to www.olac.com, A-U-L-A-C, to book your reservation today. Saving the planet has never tasted so good. And we're back and you are tuned into my weekly talk radio TV show called Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa every Thursday. Drive time, prime time at 4 p.m. on my CNBC, NBC News Radio channel, KCAA, AM 1050, FM 102.3, and FM 106.5, covering 5 million households in Southern California. But if you're not here, it's okay. You can catch it anywhere on demand, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher. We'd be here for the rest of the show, me saying all the platforms, but please do tune in. And so grateful that today is show number 400 and 74, which is over nine years, 474 consecutive weeks on the air. I'm going to give my... Validation. <laughs> so we're delighted to have Dion Lim here. She is an Emmy Award winning anchor out of San Francisco on ABC KGO TV. And we've been talking about finding some 
solutions in what we can do individually and collectively with all of this Asian hate. So I'm going to ask you, were you reporting on this before the Atlanta massage parlor shootings? Because I, I remember signing a petition in June, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the time this was after COVID, I call the time before COVID, hashtag BC19, but this was actually after COVID started in June, there was a petition that said all these crimes against Asian Americans and no one's reporting on it. So I'm just curious at what point you began to be sent out did you say, I want to cover this? Or were, did someone look at you and say, you're Asian, go, go report on this? Huh. How did that all come about? Oh, this is a really good question. I'm glad you asked this. So let's be honest. Representation in media has been a problem across the board and has been for a very long time. You are in it yourself, so you get it. I have been in so many newsrooms across the country where... Yes, I was the only Asian American and nobody would fight for these stories. And I remember very clearly early on in my career when I would bring up a story that was important to me. I don't think I presented it in the right way. And that's a problem too. And I talk about this in my book, that the way you communicate what matters to you to get other people to listen is really important. There was a billboard that said, yay, shameless plug. <laughs> there was a billboard for a local nursery that advertised Jap maples for sale. Nobody understood why that was wrong, calling these trees Jap maples, and it was owned by a white couple. And I went into that editorial meeting and I was beating my chest and I was so angry and I was making it all personal and all about me. And that didn't resonate with anyone in my newsroom who were, you know, all these people who were white or, you know, I think we had one black person, didn't really get it why that was in a story that should be covered. So, you know, throughout the years I've tried and then when I got to San Francisco, I realized because there was such a large Asian population that there were a lot of stories that people were starting to tell me about. It was probably two or three years ago that I first was alerted to the story of a grandma who was beaten up on a playground and left there to die. She ultimately did pass away about a year later. And that was the case that changed everything for me. Mm. In that moment, I stared at that tiny little body, that white hair, and thought, she looks like my own grandma, almost a dead ringer. Mm -hmm. So I started to internalize a little bit the importance and how I needed to to bring these stories to the light. And I'll be honest, it took me a couple days to actually pitch that story. I mean, I sent an email, you know, deaf ears, but eventually when people understood how much it meant to me, they said, okay, well, let's see what happens. And it resonated so much with the audience that mm. that is how that snowball of empowerment happened and people mm. started reaching out to me. But I didn't start really reporting on it regularly until the beginning of the pandemic. And it was not, trust me, it was not other people saying, Dion, can you go cover this? It was directly from me, generated from me, Bye. because I was getting all these leads. and. Eventually, I always like to say that an editorial meeting can be one of the scariest places because you're presenting something that could potentially be rejected. It's like it's like getting rejected from a guy that you're dating every single day. That's, um, why, that's why I don't date. <laughs> Safer that way. Um, <laughs> but but now it's to the point where. I don't get rejected that my team I know cares about the stories and knows that they're important and they pretty much let me run with whatever I bring to the table. Yes, we mm -hmm. finesse the the story content and kind of mm -hmm. tailor it to the day's the day's coverage, but overall, I don't think there has been a day that has gone by in this pandemic where they have said no, don't cover that. They've been so super supportive and I'm really grateful for that because it was not like that many years ago when I first got into the business. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Kudos to your company for that, because I think that's so important that uh, it's it's not the sensationalism at this point. It is mm -hmm. truly the highlight for change, right? Yeah. Because awareness is the first step. But then I think the more important step is the second one that you're taking, which is the willingness to do something about it. Absolutely. Totally. 
Totally. Yeah. I think I think for me, I also struggled, and I wrote an op-ed about this as well. I struggled with not wanting to be a TMZ. I didn't want to be just sensationalizing something and showing you a scandalous video. If I wanted to do that, I could give you an hour's worth of content because mm -hmm. right now in my phone, I'm holding on to surveillance videos, to witness videos, and really horrific images of people bloodied and beaten. But what good does that do if you have not talked to that person, if you haven't fleshed out the circumstances around it? Then you can begin to do something. And that's something that really ate me up alive at night early in the pandemic, seeing some of these bloggers or social media users just slap up faces because then we become less valuable. We become desensitized and become another face. You need the story always yeah. behind it in order to make change. Yeah. Excellently said and excellently done because that, that whole news uh, reputation of if it bleeds, it leads. And that's just the story right there. It's just a boom. It, 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 the whole goal is for people to look at it and say, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, right? That, and that's it. And that's the storyline. So good for you. And, and I'm going to use that as a segue as, uh, so I did a little reading and I, I just had such a good time with the one part of your story because of course the, the, the coverage or the research behind you and your love life and how your husband, he's not Asian, right? right. He's not agent Asian and his, uh, the way he makes money is as a professional poker player. <laughs> yeah. Which, which, uh, uh, I should let you tell the story, how oh, that boy. went over, how that went over, you know, meeting traditional Asian parents. Oh, you know, boy. Parents. <laughs> yes. Well, I have to say, I only dated very, like, pretty much straight laced, successful people in a traditional sense up until, you know, dating my husband, my now husband, because they would all be accomplished in school and very tangible in, in their success. But poker, you know, it's kind of like a free for all. It's like the wild west. How do you quantify that? So yeah. Yeah. I remember bringing my parents to a holiday dinner and my parents, once they learned what he did, first off, they were incredulous. They said, really? Are you sure? And I'm like, yes, I'm sure. And secondly, they asked to see his like bank statements and his, his chart of his winnings. And I thought, oh my God, if he survives this and agrees, then we're going to make it. We're going to be okay. And he totally <laughs> did. He played ball. He was so transparent. He showed all the graphs, you know, all the numbers in very bold, um, you know, he wasn't hiding anything and it ended up being okay. My parents, they didn't say anything good or bad. They just said, okay. That was right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think you tell some of that story in, in your book called make your moment. And this is the savvy woman's communication playbook for getting the success that you want. And, uh, Dion has kindly offered one as the Asian Oprah giveaway. So the first one to go to drmarissa.life and put in Dion or, um, uh, uh, Emmy Award winning ABC news anchor that all know that is what the Asian Oprah giveaway is. We'll get a copy of that book. So thank you so much for that. And I did see another thing where it said that you had dated a poet before this one. So that this was an improvement on the poet, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, su I suppose so. <laughs> but How did you meet him? How did you meet the, him? The poet at school. No, oh, no, no, no. Your husband now. Oh, my husband now. Oh, yeah. this is a good story. So yeah. this was before all those dating apps and everything. I was reporting in Springfield, Massachusetts. It's market 100 something. So really teeny tiny. And I was still technically taking you know, finishing up classes at Emerson College in Boston and working at the same time. This was before I realized you were not supposed to wander and trespass into people's backyards. There was a story about neighborhood crime and some debaucherous parties nearby. And I just went one day with my photographer and I wandered into his backyard. He saw me from his window and started yelling, hey, news lady, hey, news lady. And I thought he was going to yell at me to get me off of his lawn. But instead, I think he was kind of interested. So he asked me to interview him. I interviewed him, didn't think twice about it. He emailed the station asking for the clip of the video. And 
I had to remind myself of who he was. So I went back and I watched the video. I was like, oh, he's kind of cute. And we started talking. <laughs> and then um, once he expressed that he was kind of interested, I was the one who asked him out. Oh, yay. Let's just destroy every single stereotype of uh, an Asian woman it, right in one foul blow. That's wonderful. <laughs> Yes, I think That's this is where we get along. We smash uh, all the stereotypes. That is <laughs> so, I know, right? A anytime uh, a, a, a Caucasian guy sits at dinner on a first date and says, I've always wanted to date, I have always been attracted to Asian women. If I stayed there, I'd say, number one, I'm not cooking for you. Number two, I'm not cleaning for you. And the only way I'm walking on your back with is with high heels on. So it's going to hurt. Yes. Oh, yes. We're, we're right there with you. So we're, we're up against the end of the show. So I'm going to ask you the, the same question that every single guest has been for 474 consecutive weeks, which is to who or what are you most grateful for? Mm. I am most grateful for the young people and the audience that has supported this reporting through some very dark times. Because honestly, I would not be able to do this if it were not for all of the people who sent me direct messages or emails or on social media made comments saying, hey, keep going, please don't give up. Or I want you to know the story of my family, even though this I've never told anybody before. So it's for all the people who trusted me. And for also, I have to say, the law enforcement officials who have also helped me in my reporting and have been so cooperative in helping me shed light on what's really mm -hmm. happening. So mm -hmm. it's the people who have stood out. It's the people who have been those nails that stuck out on the board. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, truly, if I didn't have them, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. And I also wouldn't feel motivated every morning, despite all of the traumatic experiences that happen. Um, right keep forging ahead. Wonderful. Yeah. What's one piece of um, advice that you would give to anyone who's feeling uh, hated, oh. it's Asian American or otherwise? I promise you are not alone because I've well felt so alone growing up as the only Asian kid, maybe one of four or five in my school, that I went through the same struggles of, ew, people think that my lunch is gross or <laughs> that people think that my eyes look slanty and want to call me chink. But guess what? If you really dig in or if you really pay attention or just even have the faith that other people have the same experience as you, it doesn't make this process as scary any longer. And I promise you, there are a whole host of people who also want to help and band together. They just don't know it yet. Mm, beautiful. Beautifully said. Thank you so much for being a guest on my show. I'm so uh, grateful to Jin, who had a question we didn't get to. Sorry, but uh, she, she was instrumental in helping me get you here. I'm so delighted that you're part of this program, which will live forever. And thank you for the work that you do. I'm grateful for you. Thank you for championing this voice and for everyone, every one of your nearly 500 episodes. Yes, thank you. And where can people get your book? Oh, thank you for asking. If you're yes. in the Bay Area, Books Inc. is my official bookseller, or you can go on Amazon or IndieBound and um, check it out, and also Target and Barnes and & Noble. And this is a McGraw-Hill publication, so it's a very congratulations on that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. As an author yourself, I can't wait to check your book out also. Yes, I'm getting you a copy uh, yes. very soon. And also, um, if people want to support you and follow you, I know you're very active on Twitter, Right. So yes. the address for that is. Yes. All of my handles on social media, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook are at Dion Lim TV. If you just Google my name, I'm sure you'll find it. But that's how most people reach out to me these days. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And so grateful to have had her on the show. I, I forgot to tell her when she said chink, I was actually heavy as a child. So I was called a chunk a fat chink. But uh, the good news is I know how to focus my attention on the compliments that I've gotten and not the insults. And that's a, a bit of a, you know, that's my Dr. Marissa happy ADA tool for you today. If you're feeling 
the the weight of you know sticks and stones can break my bones but name names will never hurt me remember that that names will not hurt you there's an african american saying that says when there is no enemy within then nothing outside of you can hurt you so remember that it is time for uh, the end of the show, my balance bar, where I invite you to go where I am going, where no man has gone before. Just kidding. Uh, but uh, you will, uh, after tuning into this show next week, I am so happy to say that I am bringing on, uh, you may recognize him. He had the most famous fight scene with Kirk Douglas that's still uh, memorable. He is Hank Garrett, and he was the main actor in uh, Where Are You, Car 52. He's 89 years young right now. He's coming live next week on my show Thursday at 4, so don't miss it. Put your calendars on that because it's going to be a great show. Um, also, you all know about my uh, nonprofit, I hope, uh, 501C, Eight Ways to Happiness from wherever you are. If you're an Amazon shopper, please go to Amazon Smile, put in Eight Ways to Happiness, and then you will uh, make Amazon give me a small portion. It's a nonprofit directed to children, teens, and young adults on how to be happy when they've temporarily forgot. And that's it for today's show. Tune in Monday for Mind Your Own Business with Dr. Marissa. You all know that's my uh, interactive broadcast. Have the best week ever. Remember, peace in, peace out. Whoop, peace in, peace out, world. Peace through inner peace. Well, she has been dubbed the Asian Oprah and she just wants all of us to be happy. Dr. Marissa, a.k.a. the Asian Oprah, says the most important thing you can choose is choosing to be happy. You are tuned in to my weekly talk radio TV show called Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. That's the idea for Dr. Marissa Pay's new book called Eight Ways to Be Happy. Many of us say, I am my own worst critic. Nobody's harder on me than I am. And my response to that is, stop it. <laughs> Why are you doing that to yourself? You have to be your biggest fan because if you can't at the end of the day say, I did a good job, who is? We don't have to constantly be angry at the things that are wrong. Why don't we choose to be happy about things that are right? We have the choice. That's our muscle. And, and life is so amazing if we can see it.